Welcome everybody. I'm Dr. Sam Spinelli, and today we're talking about the dreaded butt wink. If you're looking for content on mobility, strength, or moving better in general, make sure to subscribe below to our channel. Turn on the notification settings so you get a notification every time we release new tips. For anyone looking for a program, you can check out the description box below. We have programs that are gonna be able to help you with mobility, stability, strength, and moving better in general. Now for anyone that hasn't heard of butt wink, let's break down what it is. Someone starts at the top of their squat, descends down, and as they get towards the bottom, usually around thighs parallel to the ground, their pelvis goes through a posterior tilt where the tailbone tucks under and points down into the backwards. As the pelvis posteriorly tilts, it brings the lumbar spine into flexion. Then as the person drives back up out of the squat, their pelvis rotates anteriorly and the spine extends. Most of the time, people say that this is a bad thing because the spine goes through a range into flexion while being under load. There are various anatomical components that people will implicate with this, such as the lumbar discs, the pars interarticularis, as well as the sacroiliac joint ligaments. Due to all these scary things, we're often told that we need to fix butt wink or avoid it in general by limiting our depth and not going down as far. We want to discuss why butt wink happens, what you can do to assess it, what you can do to maybe address it if necessary, and if it matters. First up, why might butt wink happen? One of the first arguments for it is that the hamstrings are tight, stiff, or immobile. While this is possible in some situations, in the majority of people, this is very unlikely. You see, when we're standing, with a relatively neutral position of our back, our hamstrings are at a set length. As we descend down into the squat, we flex at the hips, which would lengthen the hamstrings, but we also flex at the knees, which will shorten the hamstrings. This is pretty easy to understand, as when you're sitting down on a chair, your hamstrings aren't limiting you and causing any sort of discomfort. But if you try to straighten out your legs, you might notice some discomfort at the back of your thigh. Because the hamstrings are a two joint muscle, it's just unlikely that they could be the issue. And therefore we can just rule them out. With the hamstrings ruled out as culprits, the next thing that we can consider is the anatomical considerations of the hip joint and the glutes and adductors. The adductors and the glutes could make sense because they're a one joint muscle. They only cross the hip joint. Therefore, if they were limited in extensibility, then they could limit hip flexion motion as well. If the hip joint was limited, it would make sense that it could limit hip flexion, which would then have to have that motion made up somewhere else, such as at the lumbar spine. In the following test, we group these together because we can't essentially be able to rule them out separately. So we're gonna test them collectively. To start off our test, we're gonna begin with the rock back. What we're gonna do here is we're gonna be in quadruped position. We're gonna be on our hands and knees. We're gonna then sit back and we're gonna to look to see how far we can sit back while maintaining a relatively fixed lumbar position. In this case, your knees are flexed and your hamstrings shouldn't be involved. If you're able to sit all the way back without any change in your lower back, then this indicates that this isn't relevant for you and we can move forward. In contrast, if you can't sit all the way back and you find that you are having some posterior tilting, this is just an indicator that we wanna do a little bit more on this test. The next thing we're gonna do is repeat this test, but we're gonna change the position of your knees and your feet. What this does is it changes the relative position of your femur and your acetabulum, so your hip joint, as well as changing the relative degree of extensibility requirements on different muscles. Play around with different positions, knees more narrow, knees wider, feet more narrow, feet wider, feet rotated in more, feet rotated outwards. Moving these in different positions is gonna give you some input that you can utilize later. So let's start with that and see if you're able to sit further back by changing something. Another test that we can do is the supine hug. In this, we're gonna be laying on our back and bringing our knee towards our chest. You wanna make sure that you bend your knees so that you aren't limited by your hamstrings. And you can bring your knee in as close as you can towards midline to start, and then progressively move it out further and see if that changes anything. You can also change the angle of rotation of your shin and see how that impacts your comfort in getting into a deeper position. For most people, they get a very similar result as the rock back. This helps to guide us in what we're gonna do later in the application section. The final thing to consider is for those people that had a butt wink during their squat, but didn't have it during any of these tests. For that case, we're gonna do a tempo squat. You're gonna set up in a stance that you're comfortable with, and you're gonna begin going down nice and slow. We're gonna do it over a five to six second count and try and descend and maintain your back angle as you go through that. If you see it improve compared to normal, then you know that you gotta slow down and work on control. First thing, you don't necessarily need to fix it. In our next session, we're gonna discuss why you might not need to worry about it. But for now, we're gonna focus on some alternatives that you can put into practice in case you want to. For some people that have butt wink, it might be beneficial to change it. If you're someone who is intolerant to flexion, that's gonna be something that you might wanna avoid then. 
as well, it's possible that going into a high degree of butt wink might be limiting your force capabilities. And so from a performance standpoint, you might benefit from changing it. With those considerations, here's some options on how to work on it. First up, your stance. We have a lot of variation in our anatomy from person to person, and there's a high degree of variability between people's ankles, knees, hips, and pelvis. And all that in consideration is gonna heavily change how someone would stand in a squat. Changing how you just stand in your initiation can have a huge impact on what occurs through the movement. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna change the position of our feet, stand wider or narrower. You're also gonna experiment with having your toes more in or more out and go through the squat and repeat, progressively working on different variations of foot position and see how that implicates it. You might find some are more comfortable, some are more uncomfortable and use that information to decide where you should go. Next one, pelvis positioning. If you're someone with a relatively large anterior pelvic tilt or someone who arches their back a lot to initiate the squat, you're likely going to benefit from going into a little bit of posterior pelvic tilt to start. You see anterior pelvic tilt and hip flexion are a coupled motion. When you anteriorly tilt, you're entering into some hip flexion. You have a limited capacity of hip flexion available. And so if you start off in hip flexion as you begin the movement, you've already set yourself back from how much you have available. So if you start off the movement by thinking a cue like belt buckle to chin, where you rotate your pelvis back slightly into a little bit of posterior tilt into a neutral range, and then descend down from there, you'll have more available hip flexion range to go into. Our next one is a counterbalance. Here, we're gonna hold out a weight in front of us, and we're gonna utilize that to see if it changes the movement. You can grab a 10 or 25 pound plate, hold it out in front of you, and then squat down in your normal stance and see what happens. For a lot of people, this cleans it up and it looks way better. Why? We don't know. One possibility is that it helps in allowing you to stay upright while you sit down and back if you aren't able to maintain a high forward shit angle. This is why we see a lot of people being more successful with moves like goblet squats and front squats because that anterior weight allows them to have a counterbalance. If this is you, you might benefit from spending a few weeks to a few months working on goblet squats and front squats to really dial that in. The next two are forward shin and elevated heel. These are very similar. In essence, kind of going off the previous topic, we want to encourage having a more forward knee and that's going to allow us to stay more upright and not have such of a demand on hip flexion and also forward bend. For some people, this might be limited by your ankle mobility. In a previous video we put up, we discussed this specifically, so you can go and check that out. You might find that you just have to practice the movement or you might benefit from some dedicated drills working on it. An alternative option is to use a raised heel. For some people, this small lift will counterbalance them in the same way that a forward anterior counterbalance would, and it's gonna allow you to have more room for your shin to go forward. So instead of having to sit back more because of the anterior weight, it just lets your knee go more forward and you go back as far as you normally would. An important note, anytime that you change your technique, you wanna have a period of accommodation. So it's probably beneficial to reduce your overall weight, your overall volume, and then build back up to it. So far, we've broken down why butt wink might be occurring, some options to address it if you want to, now we want to take a moment and discuss whether or not it matters. We've got a good body of research that questions how much it actually matters, contrary to what a lot of people believe. Most of the discussion around butt wink is because as we go down and we wink over, we go into lumbar flexion. Lumbar flexion is a hot topic, gets discussed a lot, and there's a lot of unclear details about it. I wrote a very in-depth article on this last year that we'll put in the description box below. It's on Stronger by Science, and it provides a good overview of all the literature that's available, contrasting both the pros and cons of it. We don't have a distinct dichotomy saying that lumbar flexion is bad. It just depends on a lot of details. For most people, it's not necessarily something to fear. If you've been doing it and you have no symptoms with it, you're probably good to go. In contrast, if you do experience symptoms with it, then you might want to avoid it. A summary of a few key points from the article. The idea of neutral spine is fairly arbitrary and it's not this concrete individual spot. And it's much more of a range. Neutral spine is not this place that is safe from all injuries. Injuries can occur in a neutral spine as well. In fact, some articles even show that the amount of injuries that occur comparing neutral spines to flex spines is very similar. It depends on a lot more details than just the range of motion that you're in. Every time that we do any sort of movement that goes into hip flexion, we have that coupled motion where we get some posterior tilting and lumbar flexion. We see this in literature on the squat, the kettlebell swing, and the good morning. Most of the high quality research on this topic looking at lumbar flexion and lifting doesn't show that being in flexion is inherently dangerous. It's more likely if you're used to it or you're not. In contrast, we do have a bunch of literature that shows that if you are highly stressed, if you have poor sleep, inadequate nutrition, inadequate preparation for training, or a large change in workload, you are more at risk for injury than just the range of motion that you're in. 
This is one of the reasons we discussed earlier that gradual build up so that you don't have a big change in workload. Hopefully this breaks down a bunch of topics that might have been confusing for you guys. Comment below on anything else you'd like to discover in the future. Tap that like button, subscribe for more content.